Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thanks again. Welcome to the summer school. I have to say it's just a delight to be here. I've been to a few of these over the years. By the way, do you need me to be by the microphone or can you hear me? You can hear me? Okay, so that means I don't have to be tethered to that. Okay. That's good. Um, so this is, you know, my first summer school that I did, I think, was actually at RPI that Jim Hendler had organized. And uh, every time there are some really good memories that come from that. Uh, first, the memory that I have from uh, Jim Hendler's uh, summer school was that we had a colleague of ours from Southampton, who shall remain unnamed, um, who sat at the back um, and uh, would sleep through every presentation, everyone's presentation. <laughs> And uh, everyone, all, those, all the faculty were sitting in the back were taking pictures of him, and the students in the front were paying attention. They had no idea what was going on in the back. <laughs> so hopefully, at least for the first day or the first morning, many of you will not, will not be asleep for this talk. Um, the other highlight I remember was um, when I was in Leiden, and I did, the, I did the talk there at the summer school, at the summer school there as well. And I was very surprised that we had six students who were all named Yulia. And so I had a picture of myself with six students with slightly different spellings, but six students who are all named Yulia. So I have to ask, is there anyone by the name of Yulia here today? We only have one? <laughs> Done. We only have one Yulia. So yeah, well, I guess the, it, it goes in phases. But there were six Yulias at that, and I will never forget that. So there was a small little trivia things. But seriously, I think the, the summer school, um, as somebody who is uh, on the board, on the member of the Web Science Trust Board of Trustees, uh, I can tell you that the summer school is one of the uh, activities of the Web Science Trust, or one that the, is promoted by the Web Science Trust, that we all take very seriously because it helps consolidate the training associated with uh, students like you. And I understand there are about 20 of you who, are, who have come to Koblenz for this, and another couple of dozen of you who are. Uh, uh, local, so I think it's a great opportunity for uh, a school not only to listen to old fuddy duddies like me, but for you to connect with each other and create a community, and so that in the years to come, you will remember these experiences uh, not so much necessarily for what was said on this side of the table, but what is said amongst you as you go through your tutorials and activities, etc. So I wish you the very best uh, as you move forward on that. <clears throat> okay, so what I was going to talk to you today was. Uh, uh, there's a lot of these different terms that get mentioned, uh, web science, internet science, network science. Some people get very religious about these issues. I just got back, uh, just got, uh, got in here from organizing in, at Northwestern the International Computational Social Science Conference. And so you see there are all these terms that get used. Uh, and um, one of the things that, and, and Markus was actually, uh, was one of the keynote speakers that I had invited for the computational, Marcus Strohmeyer, those who may not, he's next week he's speaking, I think, in this, yeah, uh, was one of the speakers there. One of the things that I think we have to be cautious is not get carried away and get religious about whether what I'm doing is web science or internet science or network science. Um, Wendy Thanasis, Wendy and a few of us wrote an article that was published in Communications of the ACM trying to lay out some of the ways in which web, internet, and net, which has the nice acronym of WIN, uh, W-I-N, that how those are actually in some ways quite complementary and they connect each other. There is a certain amount of overlap, uh, but there is no reason for us to engage in any turf war and say, well, what I do is web science and what you do is internet science. Uh, it doesn't serve any use intellectual purpose as far as I'm concerned. So what I'm going to talk about today is a more general area of inquiry that falls into, it doesn't matter to me whether it falls into one or the other, but I think an important part of what the social science community, which is where I'm based these days, uh, does is to try to see what is it that we can do so not only do we understand social phenomena on the web and elsewhere, but how can we help to enable it? How can we improve it? And so what I'm going to do is give an example of how in our research group at Northwestern, which is called SONIC, the Science of Networks and Communities, we've been making an effort to try not just to understand various phenomena, but to how to modify how to address certain societal challenges. So let me start with what the three societal challenges that I'm going to talk about today. The first one is uh, disaster response. Last year we celebrated, or at least commemorated, I should say is a better way, uh, the 10th year anniversary of Katrina. All of you here familiar with Katrina? Good. See, I know that in about 10 years if I talk about Katrina, people will go, Katrina what? 
uh, but at least you're young enough to, uh, or old enough, I should say, to remember Katrina. Uh, so Katrina celebrated 10 years, and as you remember, one of the problems with the Katrina disaster was not just the disaster itself, but the disaster that came from the disaster response. So there was a big, so this was when Hurricane Katrina hit in August 20, on August 23rd. And seven months later, there was a report that was put out by the Office of uh, Management and Budget, which basically criticized FEMA. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They criticized them for doing a really bad job of doing the disaster response. So the joke was always that the disaster response was a bigger disaster than the disaster itself. Because people, and most of it was because these organizations were not coming together and coordinating well in order to accomplish anything. So seven months later, that was, you know, and it was kind of in, uh, funny during that time, because one day George W. Bush stands next to the director of FEMA and says, my director is doing a great job, and everything is under control, and then four days later, he fired his, the director of FEMA, because they felt that they were not doing a good job in this case, etc. So we'll come back to this particular challenge again later on. The second one, which I'll spend actually the majority of time talking about today, is uh, the area of accelerating innovation. We know today that almost all work, all innovation comes from teams. Even if it didn't come previously, it certainly comes now. And some would argue it always came from teams. So we have teams that do innovation. And yet, the majority of time, the work we do in teams is not very innovative. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been part of a dream team, a really good team that did really good work? Go ahead, raise your hands. You've been part of a dream team. How many of you have had the experience of being on a nightmare team? a team that didn't do very well. Do you see this? This is my point. This is exactly my point. We've all had more experiences having nightmare teams than dream teams. And so part of it is trying to understand what is it that we could do to improve our ability to have innovation that come from dream teams. And one of the people who can tell us a little bit about it is this person by the name of David Ferrucci. David Ferrucci, anyone here recognize that name? He was the head of the team that built Watson. David actually was, he just, uh, I had dinner with him because he, he was an invited speaker at our computational social science conference in Evanston last week. David was the head of the team at IBM that was charged with build, building Watson. And as you all know about Watson, this room, yeah? No, you don't know about Watson. Okay. Some of you don't know about Watson. Watson is this phenomenal technology that was developed by IBM, which basically was you can provide it with any natural language question and it could provide you with the answer to that question faster and, in general, more accurately than human beings. So they had a big TV show in the US called Jeopardy, which is like a quiz show. And they put IBM Watson there to compete with the best champions that they had. And IBM Watson would systematically beat the best champions they had. So it was a very phenomenal piece of technology. And a lot of it involves ingesting large amounts of data from the web, not just Wikipedia, but lots and lots of data from the web, and being able to engage in some pretty sophisticated uh, cognitive computing, if you may, in order to be able to provide answers. Well, David wrote this article in the New York Times in which he said, as much as the technology of Watson is very, very complex, building the team that built Watson was far more challenging for him. There were situations where he said, when he was asked to do this by IBM first, go ahead and create a team five years to try to create something that would be able to compete with uh, people in terms of answering questions accurately and fast. He went to the smartest people. And what do you think happens when you go to the smartest people? They're all very busy. They already have 100 projects going on. You're trying to convince them about this, and some of them looked at him and goes, that's a crazy idea. We're never going to do it. I have papers to publish. I can't be doing this. And many of them actually told him, David, if you have any sense, you won't waste your time on this either, because you'll never succeed, and it's going to be a career killer for you. For you. And then, of course, he went to other people, and then he finally convinced one person. And the person said, OK, I'll give you a little bit of time to work on it. And then he went to the second person. And the second person says, well, who else do you have lined up? And he goes, oh, I have A lined up. And he rolled his eyes and said, ah, life is too short. I don't get along with A. A may be smart, but he's a jerk to work with. So you have all these different reasons. And then finally, what he said to me, and this is all, I'm doing a case study with David on this, and so I've been interviewing him a lot about this issue. And he said, well, the next thing that happened was he said one thing that worked was he finally tried to convince someone and says, well, do you know so-and-so person that we don't like very much? Well, if you don't join my team and we can't make a team, then IBM is going to ask that person to form the team. Do you really want that person to form the team? And they go, no, no, no. Okay, I'll join your team. 
So you have all these different dynamics that come in that go beyond what we normally think about in teams, which is we just get the smart people and the skills that we want and everything else will fall into place. And that's not true. So part of what I want to talk about today is how do we take team assembly in that particular context. And then the last one, which I'll touch on briefly, is a project that uh, we've just wrapped up in India and a new project that we have just kicked off in Ethiopia, where we are talking about a big challenge in the world today in global health issue is not to solve medical problems, but to scale them up. So if everyone may know that in emerging economies, certainly there is a tragedy of neonatal mortality, where the first day of a baby's life is the most dangerous day, because they're more, most likely to die on the very first day of their life. And that the neonatal mortality is about 10 times higher in Africa and India than it is in Western economies. And the good news here is that there are actually many ways of solving the problem. Chlorohexidine is an example of a very inexpensive topical solution, which if applied to the umbilical cord of a child when it's born, of a baby when it's born, there's lots of studies that show that it reduced the risk of death by neonatal mortality by 25% or 20%, etc. So the, the good news is we have inexpensive ways of being able to reduce neonatal mortality. The bad news is that these have not been scaled up. They've been tried in small places, but they've not been scaled up to large instances. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has made a big case for what they call scale up. How do you take an idea that you know works in one area and scale it up so that it can work for an entire state, an entire country, or an entire continent? And so part of what I want to show is how we can look at computational methods and, and network science as a way of scaling up some of those kinds of issues. So my key takeaway today that I want to say is that we are in the midst of this perfect storm that when you think about when you're in the midst of web science, internet science, or network science, which I'm calling WINS for short, that the reason why I think this area is very exciting and has drawn a lot of attention and perhaps explains why all of you are here today in beautiful Koblenz is that there are four reasons that are really contributing to this. And I think it's mindful for you from different disciplines, for all of us from different disciplines, to at least recognize what these four components are, even if our work is focused more on one or two of the four components. The first component is that we have lots of really interesting social science theories on why we engage in certain activities. And I think it's important that even if we come from other areas, we are aware of what these social science theories are telling us about what is our motivation to engage in certain actions. And so I will talk a little bit more about this, but I've already said to you that sometimes in teams, for example, we have social dynamics that come into place. When it comes to scale up of global health, it's the same thing. There are social theories about persuasion, about social influence. Why is it just because something is good, that doesn't mean that everyone is going to use it. People have to be persuaded of it. So we have to understand the social science theories in this area. The second thing is that we can have social science theories, but a lot of the interesting and exciting things today is that we're also developing very interesting methods. A lot of the work that was done in the area of network science, for example, was until about 10 years ago very descriptive. It would describe a network. It will say, this network is very centralized. This network is very dense. But we have to go beyond description towards causal explanation. We need to understand why certain things are happening. It's not enough to say that a network is a scale-free network, for example, or a network is a small world network. Likewise, it's not enough to say, and, and it has been done, and it's important work, but it's not enough to say that we see certain things on the web. The question is, why do we see those things on the web? What explains why something is happening on the web? Now, the good news here is that some of these methods are theory-driven, that is more traditional social science ways, but one of the things that the social scientists have to recognize is that the computing uh, approaches have given us some very exciting data-driven approaches. So you will be learning more about machine learning techniques, etc. And frankly, a lot of social science people say, oh, but that is voodoo, data analysis. And I would disagree with that. I think there are lots of interesting things that we can do by learning from machine analytic techniques, what are called data-driven techniques, whether it's text analytics or in some other machine learning approaches, et cetera. So I think part of what is exciting about the methods world is that for the first time, we have some really interesting ways of combining theory-driven and data-driven approaches to help our understanding to go beyond description and to go into what I would call either explanation, and in some cases, maybe not always explanation, but at least good prediction. And we can have an interesting debate about whether it is valuable to have prediction without explanation or not. The third thing is you can have all the theory and the methods that you want, but if you don't have data, then what's the point? And I can tell you that when I went to grad school, when I took my first PhD seminar in network science, 
it was called network analysis, it, didn't, it was not even called network science. This was in 1988, were any of you born in 1988? One person was born, a few people were born, okay. Uh, but when I took that first class, a big data set was about 300 people because almost all network data was collected through surveys. That's the only way we would collect it. Today, obviously, that has changed dramatically. And so what we have now is the, the, we have the data that allows us to test these ideas at scale in ways that we didn't do before. And then finally, one that I will not talk much about today, but we will rely on very heavily, is the, computing, uh, is the co computational infrastructure to make this happen. Even when I, was, when I was at Illinois before coming to Northwestern, I was associated with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And they had the best supercomputing facilities at the time. And eight years ago, when I moved from Champaign to Chicago, to Evanston, to Northwestern, we would, we would run some analysis and online games, some of which I'll show you results today, of large networks. But we would start the statistical, statistical analysis and come back three days later to see the results. Today, those results can be accomplished in a day, and even less than that again on supercomputing capabilities. But of course now we have new analytic techniques that take us three or four days to do again. So there's always going to be a chicken and egg race between you know, how we develop new techniques uh, and the computational infrastructure that it is utilized to be able to leverage those techniques. So these are the four things that I want us to be mindful of. As I said, I won't talk much about that last one. There are others perhaps in the summer school who will talk more about uh, ways in which we can use things like Hadoop and other better scale infrastructure to be able to engage in doing these analysis. So here are some of the theory questions we thought we couldn't answer. Is there a way to have that blinking hand get away from there? It's driving me crazy. It must be driving you even more crazy. Because I don't have to see the screen. Oh, is that what it is? OK. So the first one is disaster response. We talked about these challenges. I'm going to come back to that. So let's see, how do, do multi-organization networks emerge in response to a disaster? So remember, when you have a disaster, these networks are latent, they're dormant. The moment a disaster happens, you have to activate the whole network. So how do these come together, and what are the ways in which we can make them better? So the first question is really a science question. How do they emerge? And then the second question is, how do we monitor and design interventions to make them be more effective? You can say the first is a science question, the second is more of an engineering question or an intervention question of some kind. In the case of accelerating innovation, what are the network factors that influence the assembly of innovative teams? We've already said that many times teams that assemble are not dream teams. So what factors influence why people come together in team? And the second is, what can we do by using recommender systems to help put together teams that are more effective? How many of you have heard of Match.com? How many of you have heard of Tinder? So these are what, are, what are these examples of? Go ahead. They are recommender systems for romantic relationships typically, right? Why don't we have a match.com for teams? Or why shouldn't we have a match.com to put teams together? So part of what I want to talk about today is understanding why people work together in teams, and what are the factors that are likely to make teams more effective, and then use those insights from the social science by trying to help bake them into algorithms to make recommendations for more effective teams. Okay? And then the last one is scaling up global health solutions. What are the network factors that, det that determines who influences whom and how in terms of adopting good global health practices? And the second part of that is how do we utilize this knowledge to scale up innovation and, and it would build up sequencing strategies that are going to maximize innovation. Okay, so let's then jump into the, from the theory, the next question as well is always great to have theory, but until recently we didn't have the data that would allow us to test it. My colleague David Lazar, uh, who's at Northeastern University, shows this uh, set of slides. He says that if you're an astronomer, you get your data from the Hubble telescope and it costs $2.5 billion. If you're a particle physicist, you get your data from CERN, from the Hadron Colliders. And there you get, when it works, it's a billion dollars a year that you pay to get those kinds of data. But if you're a web scientist or a network scientist like us, this is where we get our data from. And you can say it's priceless. On the other hand, we know it's not, because as we have seen from the PRISM collection program, et cetera, you see this is a graphic of how which year, which major provider began to share the data with the government. 
But the bottom line is if the government can share, can have these data, these are things that we can benefit from. And hopefully somebody in the course of the summer school year will talk at some length about the web observatory. That has been a big part of what the Web Science Trust is doing. And it's a way for us to be able to uh, at least let other people have some meta information about various data sets that, with that have been collected by various universities and institu research uh, institutes on what is happening in on terms of web data and being able to share these kinds of data over or across uh, the academic community. So on the basis of this, David Lazar and a bunch of us published an article in science in 2009 that where we call these things computational social science. The idea was that just like you have social science that does through surveys, that has experiments, that has case studies, that has qualitative data, that has ethnographies, a new approach that goes along with these, not to replace them, but to go along with them, is something called computational social science, where we can look at social science at scale. And the web is, I think, an example, a perfect example that allows us to observe phenomena on the web at scale at very large levels, etc. So, so starting first with the disaster response then, is there a way to open some of these windows? I can see some of you are pretty hard. Are these doors or windows openable so that we can get a little bit of the nice, cool Koblenz area? If it's a distraction, close it. I'm just seeing some people get a little hot here, and, and I know it's not because, may, maybe it's because of my hot air that I'm blowing, but we'll see if that can change. Okay, so let's look at Katrina then. This is how the, it began, right? So it started out in Florida and then moved up into New Orleans, etc. One of the interesting things about Katrina is that in the U.S. actually, every time there's a disaster, every agency that is required to work with a disaster is supposed to file daily a report that is called a situation report. A situation report is shortened to SITREP. And so the idea here is that every organization, every day that is involved, will have to say in unstructured text what they did, who they worked with, what are their plans for the future, etc. So an example of that would be this. So this was a situation report that was issued by the Colorado Division of Emergency Management on August 30th. It basically says, here's the event type, here's the situation, here's what we did, here's the weather report, here are the agencies involved, and here is the additional assistance that is required. Now, the nice thing about this is that a colleague of mine, Carter Butts, who's at the University of California, Irvine, he hired a bunch of undergraduate students to go through these. He scraped this from the web every day, every situation report. And then what he did was he went through, he had his undergrads go through it, and see that at which organizations reported working with which other organizations. So he created an interorganizational network by looking at the situation report. Meantime, I, we were both, uh, Carter and I were both funded at the time through the National Science Foundation on projects that were related on, a, on related topics. So what we did was we got the data from Carter and we instead began to do some text analytics at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. I mentioned previously that that um, NCSA at Illinois. By the way, for those who are not familiar, this was also the NCSA at Illinois was where the Mosaic web browser was developed. So it is the home in some ways of a lot of what we now understand in terms of web browsing and so on. So uh, they had developed these techniques that allowed you to do essentially entity extraction, entity resolution, and then looking at relationships between entities. And so we used this cutting edge technology that was developed by them at the time and began to develop networks not just of organizations, but organizations, people, locations, and concepts. So it's a multidimensional network where links exist between these organizations. And what you see out here is the red, so the blue is people, so Governor Jeb Bush was the governor of Florida. Red is organizations like FEMA, American Red Cross, etc. Green is locations, Louisiana, New Orleans, Alabama, Florida, Texas, etc. And part of what we wanted to do was to see how these were connected. So a link exists between two nodes if in the narrative those two words showed up together. Okay, so if Jeb Bush and Florida showed up together, then they are closely linked. And then the layout here shows which organizations were central and which were not peripheral. One of the interesting things here which you can't see in the graphic is that there's a lot of connections here in Louisiana. Remember, Florida is central because this was taken on the first day, and on the first day, most of the stuff was happening in Florida. It had not gone up to New Orleans. But in New Orleans at the time, all the petroleum organizations were already very well connected. They were prepared for Katrina. But on the top, what you see out here is that the, this is not very well connected 
This is the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and a bunch of other shelter, animal shelters and human shelters. And those organizations were not well prepared. So imagine, these situation reports are issued every day. You can do this analysis in close to real time, and you can immediately begin to see where the problems are in the network. You don't have to wait seven months to see that, what, what is going wrong and what is going right, etc. So I'm going to send you through this movie, and what you see is as you change time, we did this graphic here where we looked, we mapped the importance of two organizations. The American Red Cross is in red, and the green is FEMA. And the x-axis is time. The y-axis here is the rank in terms of how central that organization is. So a small value means they were highly central. And you can see that initially, um, the, the FEMA, sorry, FEMA with green one year, was quite central. It has a small value. But as you change time, it drifts, and it's basically the American Red Cross that becomes much more central. Now, this tells you also in real time that FEMA was doing something wrong. Remember we saw that report that said seven months later they found that FEMA was not doing a good job? This gives you in real time the idea of being able to do this. So part of what you want to do is very simple network analysis, nothing causal. It's mostly all descriptive. But even by looking at descriptive data, you can begin to see the, where there is a problem in the network and begin to see how you might want to make an intervention to fix that particular problem. So how did this approach benefit from WINS? Well, the first is individuals don't always have the knowledge and the bandwidth to complete network surveys. Imagine if in the middle of a disaster, you go to people in these organizations and say, please stop what you're doing and answer my network survey to tell me which organizations you're working with. Right? You can't do that. Plus, that data that they're going to give you is only about organizations. Remember, our network included concepts, organizations, people, places, etc. So that was another advantage of being able to do that. The second was, as I said, is also not just networks with organizations, but also people, places, and concepts. And then the last is to do all of this in close to real time. And being able to do it in a way that you can then actually not only find out in real time, but make interventions so that you could change and mitigate against problems that are happening within the disaster. Okay, so the next one we're going to focus on, as I said, the majority of the talk is on accelerating innovation. What are the network factors that influence the assembly of innovative teams? And how do we design a dream team, that b the builder, to optimize their assembly? So my colleague, ben, uh, Brian Udsi and Ben Jones, who were at Kellogg with me at Northwestern, and Stefan Wukti, who was at Northwestern at the time, published a series of articles in Science Magazine where they looked at the Web of Science database. Are you all familiar with the... Uh, Web of Science, it's a big bibliographic database. So they looked at that database and they looked at 20 million articles over five decades. And then they also looked at the US patent records, two million patents over, over 30 years. And they wanted to see whether there were certain trends they could find out. The first finding they have here, they had, they've had four findings. The first finding is more and more work gets done in teams. If you look at articles over time, year, you will see that science and engineering art percentage of articles that are written by teams, meaning more than one person, goes up dramatically over time. Patents go up over time. Social science goes up over time. Even humanities in green, it is significantly going up over time, even though in general that is still considered as solo work. First finding. Second finding is articles that are written by teams are more, uh, have a higher impact than articles that are written by individuals. And you might say, we are all academics, you might say, well, if there are five people writing an article and all five people cite the article, then of course an article by five people will be cited more than an article by one person. This corrects for that. And you still find that there's a higher impact of articles written by multiple people. The third finding is articles written by multiple people from different disciplines has an even higher impact than articles written by multiple people from the same discipline. And then, so in other words, if you have somebody from computer science working with a social scientist, that's going to give you a higher impact than if you just have social science or computer science people. And then the fourth finding is that articles written by people from different disciplines, from different geographic locations or different universities, has an even higher impact than articles written by people from different disciplines at the same university. So, you can say, okay, I'm here at the summer school. I'm going to find somebody from a different discipline. I'm going to find someone from a different university. And I will have a high impact article on my hand. I'm, I now know the secret sauce. I know the magic of having a high impact article. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily always going to happen. And in fact, there was work that was done by uh, Jonathan Cummings and Sarah Kiesler, 
where they looked at all the projects funded by the National Science Foundation in a certain period of time, in, a, in the area of IT actually, and they looked at, and they found something quite interesting. They found that if the y axis here is the pro productivity of the project, <coughs> excuse me, how many articles they have published, how many graduate students did they graduate, how many placements they had, etc. And what they found is that the productivity goes down as the number of universities increases. So, the more universities you have on a project, the less productive the project. And furthermore, that decline was even more steep when you had more five disciplines as compared to if you have one discipline. So, this seems to be almost exactly the opposite of what I just said. You with me? Okay. Now, they did find one mitigating circumstance. They found that if these people had previously worked together, then the damage is not so serious. It is still bad, but it is not as bad. But so, this still leaves you with a quandary. Is this a paradox? Well, it turns out it is not a paradox, because what this is saying is that most of the time working across disciplines and across universities is very difficult and it fails. However, in the few instances where it does succeed, it succeeds spectacularly and what we are observing is the really big success stories when you look at the web of science. What you do not see in the web of science are all the failures, the articles that never got written or the articles that never got published, because they were written but got rejected. So, part of what we want to do then is to try to understand what is motivating us to form teams and are there ways in which we can understand why some teams are more successful than other teams. Okay. So, my colleagues and I worked on a book and a set of theories that try to ask ourselves a very basic question and I will ask you this question. When you want to form a team, what do you look for? How do you decide who to put on your team? Go ahead. The qualities of the person, what kinds of qualities did you have in mind? Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So you're looking for skill sets that match the job, right? Okay. What were you going to say? Uh huh. How to communicate? So there's a social dynamic that you also comes into thing. Okay. What about? You want to get as diverse as you can get. Diverse in what dimension? You want people to contradict each other yeah. and every, in every dimension. Yes. Okay. Very good. How, does anyone have a bad experience with, very, with people contradicting each other in teams? <laughs> sometimes it is not does not always work. It is a good idea, but sometimes you think that that can also have its own potential problems right? when you have too many diverse people in it. I saw some hands go up there and other ideas. Yes. Reliability. Very good. So, you want somebody who when they say they can do something, they actually deliver it on time, right? Very good. Someone whose interests match yours outside of work. So, in other words, you are saying that you would like to build software with someone who supports the same Euro 2016 football team that you support, right? Very good. No, no, these are all good explanations. Anyone else? Any other final ones? Yes. Feelings. Feelings. That is, what do you feel about that person? Whether you like that person? Whether you enjoy being with that person? Yes. The team that can play together well. So, you begin to see now that we started out by talking about the most obvious things we think about, which is skill sets. And of course, that is important. But as we began to uncover it, we went into a lot of other areas. And part of what I wanted to do by in the slide is to summarize it along exactly those lines. The first is there are, yes, sorry. Perform, exactly. In fact, we use that as a title of, a, of a, one of our papers, where we see we do analyses to see how teams form. And then what we find is that many of the most common ways in which teams form, they do not perform. And so, this is the, we call it the form perform paradox. So, that is exactly, you are exactly right. So, the first is theories of self interest and that is skill, that is an economic model. 
I need somebody on my mobile development team who can do X, Y, and Z. And I know that you have those skills, so I'm going to go get it from you. Right? That's, I'm going to try to maximize my individual utility function. Do you know which discipline talks like that? Which discipline says I want to maximize my individual utility function? Economics, exactly. So it's an economic model, right? I'm just trying to maximize it. The second approach says, well, I can't be so selfish because when I ask someone for help, they may not always answer me, right? So the second one is you say, well, you know, what I want to try to do is I'm going to set up an exchange system where I know that I want something from Lindsay, but I also know that Lindsay wants something from me. So we set up a social exchange system, and she's more likely to answer me because she's also getting something out of it. Or the third thing that I could do is I could say, well, another approach is that I don't really want anything that Marcus has, and God knows Marcus doesn't want anything that I have. But what we could do, what we are, know is that if Marcus and I join together, we have a better shot of getting something from a third party. Right? So it's not that I'm giving you something and you're giving me something, but together we have a better shot of getting something from a third party. That's collective action. Anytime you have a campaign, anytime you have any lobbying efforts, anytime you have setting standards, whether it's on the web or in industry standards, etc. Those are all efforts where people come together, not because they're giving to each other, but because once they set the standard, they, are, they can get more business from other people. Those are three very strategic reasons why we form teams. On the right hand side are non-strategic reasons, but human nature, why you form teams. And the first one is contagion. Okay. One of the people obviously who has been very involved in the helping set up this summer school year is as you all know from emails is Ulrich. Okay. So when you look at a place like this and you see that you know, people are coming to talking to Ulrich because everyone wants to get in touch with him. So if you're a new person, as many of you are today here, you look around and you go, well, Ulrich is the person to know. Right? I, everyone else is talking to him. I should go talk to him as well. Right? So what happens? The rich get richer. The people who are already well connected become better connected. The same thing happens in teams. In scientific collaborations, people who are already collaborating with a lot of people become very attractive. Programmers who are already working on a lot of projects become very attractive. Is that always good? Not necessarily. As many of my collaborators will tell you that I'm behind on almost every project that I'm collaborating with them on because I have so many of them, right? So after a while, there's a bandwidth capacity that sometimes may not be there. On the other hand, because I have experience doing it, I may be able to make some contributions that a more novice person will not be able to make. So there's a trade-off there. The second one is balance, okay? I'm more likely, or let's, but let's put it this way, I know Kyosuke because Kyosuke is, works in my research lab at Northwestern. And now that I have introduced Kyosuke to Marcus, now the question is that is it more likely that Kyosuke and Marcus will work together on a project? In other words, do you, are you more likely to form a team with your friend of a friend? And the answer is yes. Why would you be more interested in forming a team with a friend of a friend than a complete stranger? Trust, Trust exactly. There's a very interesting finding in networks that says that the amount of, to predict the trust between any two people, it's directly proportional to how many common acquaintances they have. For a very simple reason, the more people we have in common, the more likely I trust you because if you mess with me, all our common friends will find out about it. Right? So trust is a big reason why balance works. Balance is friends of a friend. The next one is homophily. You want people who share your interests. And we heard two versions of it. We heard the diversity version here, and then we heard the person who had similar interest in Euro 2016 here, right? And in fact, there is a very, very strong tendency in which people are like to work, to sit with people and talk to people and team up with people like yourself. Look at your neighbors right now as you're sitting here and see if you're sitting next to somebody because you have something in common. Am I wrong? I'm not wrong. It's a natural phenomenon that happens consistently. Is it always good? Not necessarily. There was a series of studies that have been done that shows that people, they, uh, Scott Page, who's at the University of Michigan, did a, a very interesting experiment. He gave people a creativity task, and he said, some of these teams are with very, very, simple pe very similar people, not simple, they may be complex, but they were similar people. Birds of a feather flock together. And he had other teams that were very diverse. Okay. This is the difference between the two of you. And what he did was he gave them the task and he scored how creative they were on the task on a scale, on a scale of 1 to 10. 
And who do you think was more creative? Wrong. Trick question. On average, the two teams were equally creative. But the difference was in the standard deviation, the variance. The non, the homophilous teams, the birds of a feather, they all had their creativity scores between 4 and 6 on a scale of 1 to 10. But the diverse teams, some of them were 10, which is what you are hoping for, but some of them were 1, which is what you feared, right? That you have teams that are sometimes when you have diverse teams, you can have problems. So diversity enables creativity, but doesn't guarantee it. Right? There are lots of instances where it fails. So part of the way, we can come back to this in Q&A, part of the way is you try to build diversity on work-related issues, but combine it with homophily on non-work-related issues, because that allows the team to bond in, in areas that help them to socially glue together, but still maintains diversity in skill sets that you might require in order to get different kinds of issues. And then finally, proximity, which says that you're more likely to form teams with people who are close by to you. And people said, well, now that we live in the age of the web, we don't have to work with people next to us. We can work with people halfway around the world. The Economist had a cover story which said the death of distance. It doesn't matter anymore. People can talk to people anywhere. Distance is dead. Well, many years later, about three years ago, The Economist corrected itself. It didn't have a cover story, but in the back it said, you know, we said that death of distance. Well, it turns out that's not true. And in fact, as I'll show you in some of the results, Today, people continue to collaborate a lot with people proximate to them. We'll form teams with people proximate to them. And the reason we now realize this is that we think that because technologies are there, we can collaborate, communicate with anyone anywhere in the world. Yes, that's true. But that's different from saying who we actually do collaborate with. And there's a new 80-20 rule that says that 80% of our use of technologies is to collaborate with people who are within a short distance of us. So think about how you use technology. Think about how you use Skype, how you use iMessage, or any of the SMS techniques that you use. It turns out that the most majority of times we use that to communicate with people who are close by to us. We did a study with the AOL Instant Messenger back in when I was at Illinois. And we found you to use it to communicate with people in the same city as you, in the same department, in the same building, in the same dorms sometimes in the same floor, sometimes in your same dorm room. How often do you send messages to people who are very close by to you using technologies? So the thing is that technologies have actually enabled proximate communication even more than what they have done in terms of distance communication, which is somewhat counterintuitive, but it's something to keep in mind as you look at this thing. Okay, so the nice thing is that each of these theories has a unique structural signature. In other words, if people are operating on the basis of self-interest or social exchange or collective action, you will see certain network patterns of who they connect with, etc., that allow you now to statistically say that if I were to do a network of who teams with whom in this room, I can answer questions such as, is this team formation here being driven by uh, self-interest? Is it driven 20% by social exchange? Is it driven 15% by homophily? And so on and so forth. And so the techniques that are used to do that are called exponential random graph models. And you can think of these as a statistical MRI. It's like doing an X-ray of the network to identify what teams are forming. And so part of what has been so exciting is that we no longer have to just describe teams. We can see what motivates people to form the team. And then we can do the second part of what you said, which is to see if what motivates people to form teams that are successful are different from what motivates people to form teams that are unsuccessful. That's really the gist of what this entire idea here is. So let's take an example of how that works. First, you can think of a team as just a collection of individuals. Those are the skill sets that we talked about at the back. The second is you can say, well, it's not just individuals. It's also their relationships. So this is where we talk about feelings or other background that they had. And the third one, which we have not talked about, is to what extent we have to recognize that we are on teams, on multiple teams at the same time. And some of these teams have overlapping members. So, you know, we may, three of us may be on a team, but then you are on a team with those three people who are on a team with those three people. And if you think of this ecosystem of teams, you can make the argument that how well my team does actually depends not only on the people on my team, but which other teams these people belong to and what they learn from those teams and what other teams those people belong to, etc. Okay, so we had a lot of data that we collected from the web. These are things called massively multiplayer online games. How many of you are familiar with MMOs? One, two, three, four, five. Some, some were not willing to admit it. I was giving a talk in China, 
and uh, all the Chinese students were sitting at the back and I asked how many of you play these games and everyone was raising their hands and then the Chinese professor was sitting in the front. He turned, looked back at the students and all of them took their hands down. <laughs> so you don't have to admit it if you don't want to. So yeah, anyway, so this is a collaboration that we have with computer scientists at Minnesota, Jaideep Srivastav, and then other colleagues at USC and at the University of Illinois. And um, you might ask, you know, why do you study these games? So those who are not familiar with it, you basically go online and there are millions of people who are playing the game. You take on a certain character in the game that gives you certain strengths and weaknesses, and then you go kill monsters, and you go get plunder, you quest for plunder. And then sometimes you go, okay, well, uh, you can't do it by yourself, so you have to form teams because you have some strengths and other people have different strengths, and you join together, and that way you are more likely to be able to win and to kill more monsters, etc. Many of my colleagues in, uh, in the U.S. tell me, why are you wasting your time studying these silly, massively multiplayer online games when there is so much more important issues to do? And there are two reasons that I give them. Uh, there are two reasons why I give them, and then there's a third reason that I'll give you. The, the, I'll start with the third reason. The reason we got interested in this, the reason I got interested in this, was because we have the data. It's very different. This is one of the great examples of you know, where you look for data under the lamppost. Are you familiar with the, with the story about the drunken person and the lamppost? Not everyone here. So there was a drunk guy, and he lost his car keys. And he was looking for his car keys. His car was parked there, and he was looking for it here. And somebody asked him, well, why are you looking for your car keys here if your car is parked there? He goes, this is because this is where the light is. So this is where I can see if the car keys are here or not, right? So you can make the argument that this was the kind of data that first became available online because people were playing the games. And so since it was difficult to get data like this offline, it made sense to study these things. That's reason number one. But reason number two is that this is a very serious effort. These games has, is a big part of the economy. If you look at all the money that is spent on these games, these massively multiplayer online games, it would make it the eighth largest country in the world in terms of GDP. So this is not some small marginal effort. And then the third one that is mentioned in this article in Harvard Business Review, that was written by uh, Byron Reeves, Tom Malone, and Tony O'Driscoll, is that, in fact, one of the reasons why we should study these games, they call it Leadership's Online Labs, is because tomorrow's leaders are learning how to be leaders by playing these games. If you look at these online games, there are sometimes teams of 60 people that go on these massively complex quests to go decimate some other monsters and decimate other people. And you know what's interesting? That very often these 60-person teams that involve people from all ages, all the way from young kids to 40, 50 year old, the leader is often a 12 or 13 year old teenager. That's how they learn how to become leaders. And so this is a way of previewing what tomorrow's leaders are going to look like. So it is their online labs. So we had this game, this is what it looks like. This was collected from a game by Sony Online, which is called Sony EverQuest 2. And so we got the data, the digital trace data from the Sony Online Entertainment. They gave us every action, every interaction, every transaction in the game, time stamped. We didn't, we didn't get any text, so just the traces. And this is what it looks like. So you have the characters. These are the different characters in the game. And this one, they're killing this monster, as you can see there. So in this study, we had data. We took data from just about a little over two weeks, around two weeks. And from one server in the US, and you had about 8,000 players that were in 46,000 groups with 9 million combat records. So these are teams that are killing these monsters, etc. And we look for team diversity. So we're taking your idea of if you have people from different character types, are those teams? So sometimes you could be a fighter. That's an offensive player. A mage is a magician. They can cast a spell on someone. A scout is a defensive player. This person cannot go kill people, but it can help protect you from getting killed. And then the priest is like a healer, is like a doctor, that if you get hurt in the game, they can try to heal you. So there are different characters, and we wanted to see if teams that had different characters were going to be more successful. And then the second was the cosmopolitan level. To what extent is a person on a team um, going to, if they have people on other teams, if people on your team play with people on other teams, is your team going to do better? The nice thing about these games is you have very good performance metrics. We know exactly how many points they gain, how many monsters they kill, how much level they gain, and how often you got killed. Because in the game, you can get killed. So that's a negative measure of performance. And then after you get killed, you come back after a short time. But you're penalized for being killed. What did we find? We find that diversity helps the group to achieve more. 
So teams that had more diversity of people from across the characters had higher experience points, they killed more monsters and they gained more level, but they didn't pr uh, help you in terms of not getting killed. On the other hand, if you had teams, members in your team who were connected to a lot of other teams, those teams protected you from getting killed, even though they didn't help you on the positive side. So what is interesting here is that there are different facets of things within the team and outside the team that help you succeed. Diversity helps you get more positive experiences, but having people on other teams prevents you from getting negative experiences, like getting killed in the game, etc. So I'm going to go through very quickly now, because I know I'm a little behind on, in terms of my time scale here. So this was a project where we looked not at online games, but this was people who were submitting proposals to the National Science Foundation. So you're all familiar with the National Science Foundation. It's one of the largest agencies that funds basic science research outside of health sciences in the US. Sometimes people say NSF stands for not sufficient funds because it's very competitive to be able to get funding from them, etc. So we looked at to see you know, how, who submits proposals and who submits successful proposals. So we got data from about over a thousand grant proposals, some of which were funded, some were not funded. And we combined that data with data from the web of science. So we knew who had co-authored with each other, we knew who cited each other, etc. And so one of the, and this was over a three year period and two interdisciplinary programs. And we asked a very simple question, who submits proposals? Well, not surprisingly, we find that if two people have previously co-authored uh, an article, they're more likely to submit a proposal in the future, which makes sense. You already work together, we'll go and submit a proposal. It also makes sense that people who have cited each other will submit a proposal. That if two people cite one another, that means they know of each other's work, they are familiar with it, etc. They're more likely to submit a proposal together. So nothing surprising here. We change the question now to who submits successful proposals. So this goes back to your notion of teams that form, who submits proposals, and teams that perform, who submits successful proposals. And when you change the questions to who submits successful proposals, again we find that people who have co-authored with each other are more likely to submit successful proposals because they have a good working relationship. Yes? Is this the definition of success here is of the fact because you're not looking at the practice of the people performing here. You're looking at the practice of the people getting the funds from another agency. Right. So the success here is defined as whether your project was funded. So that is judged by some other people, not the people who are giving the proposal. That is correct. So you cannot actually judge the success of these people. That is correct. I think you can. I think there are, uh, uh, yes, I think you can. Because when you say a team is successful, it doesn't matter what the people in the team said. They may say they had a really good time writing a proposal. But at the end of the day, if the proposal is not funded, that's an unsuccessful proposal. But that's the trend that actually follows. Like, you know, when we submit a proposal, we actually explain that people who have collaborated before have the chance of getting a proposal accepted higher. So that, that's how, you know, the whole domino effect is coming up. So yeah, you can, you can make an argument for that. First of all, I'll come back to that question in a minute. But I want to make sure I get the second finding. And that is that people are, who submit proposals, who cite each other, are actually less likely to get funded. That's the second one. And this might seem counterintuitive that I want to put on the table, and then I'll come back to your question. And why is that? And we found this in many cases. This is only one study, but we found this across studies for projects that were submitted to the National Institutes of Health. That people who submit successful proposals are people who have previously co-authored with each other, but who don't cite each other. Even though the, most of the proposal teams that are submitted are by people who co-author each other and do cite each other. Why do you think this might be the case? The intuition that we reached after looking at these results for a while and scratching our heads is that if two people don't cite each other, what does that mean? That means this person they're from different fields. This person is citing this field, this person is citing this field. So when you have people from different fields coming together and collaborating, there, there is a much greater chance of innovation because we know that innovation comes from the recombination of ideas that were previously not connected together. So, so in other words, what, what this is saying is this is one definition of success is that you can say a definition of success is just did the team enjoy it. But another definition of success is did, did other people who are supposed to be impartial reviewers think that this is a good idea? I presented these results at the National Science Foundation because they were quite interested to know what happens here. And they looked and I said, well, this is only the first measure of success because this only means they got funded. They still haven't actually done the work, so we don't know what publication come. 
And they said, no, actually this is the second measure of success. And I'm like, what do you mean? Because the first measure of success is if they actually submitted the proposal. Yet very often teams come together and they work on ideas and they never get to actually submit the proposal. So this is the second measure of success. And then the third measure of success, of course, over time is what publications come out of it and so on and so forth. Okay. So again, moving ahead, here is another example at the team level. So now I'm looking at relationships between people, right? Who they co-authored with, who they cited. Now if you go back to the online game environment, we looked again at these teams that were forming in the game. And this was a different data set uh, that we looked at. This was exactly one week of data. And these were the kinds of networks that you see. These are the teaming networks. These are people who play with one another in partnership. This is a trade network which also has a different kind of team. A trade network in these games is that very often in the games, for those of you who are familiar with it, if you go have a plunder and you get gold, in the virtual gold in the game, right? Now what you can do is you can buy, use it to buy yourself fancy houses, fancy clothes, all in the game, right? To look, and to look very spiffy in the game, etc. So there's trade in the game. They have an actual marketplace where you can buy and sell things. Where some people don't really play the game to go kill things, they are more interested in making products like shirts and vests and houses and things that you want to buy. Okay? So there's a legitimate market, but there's also an illegitimate market within the game. And the illegitimate market in the game, which is mostly made up of Chinese, I'm sorry to say, or maybe I'm happy to say because they're smart, is what they do is they start playing the game at 7 o'clock in the morning with a level 0 character and play the game repetitively to do things and build the character to a level 70 character. And then after they have a level 70 character, they will sell the level 70 character illegally to some lazy person from the West who doesn't have the time to build the character but has the money to buy the character. That is called gold farming. And in fact, the World Bank recommended in their report to China that Chinese should play this game because the amount of money they earn is more than the minimum wage in China. But the companies like Sony don't like this game because if, if, are, if you are playing your high-level character and you bring somebody who doesn't know what they're doing but bought a high-level character, that's not so much fun to play with. Imagine Tomorrow, if there's a person who comes here in the summer school as a PhD candidate, but they bought their PhD candidate because they didn't really, you know, they've never done anything in schooling. That's not so much fun. You're not going to enjoy doing teamwork with them tomorrow, right? So they want to get rid of these people. So in this, unfortunately, there's another team that forms. Because if you'll say, ah, if I, if I see some Chinese person selling it to an American or a European, I'll just shut down their account. Well, these people are smart. What they do is they take it so that they then send that, they, the person who builds the character doesn't sell it immediately. They gift it to a friend of theirs who then leaves it in another friend's house, who then sells it for a really low price to another friend. And that person finally sells it to you, the lazy Westerner. So they have a whole team that works to sell these characters. And my former student, uh, Brian Keegan, who actually had a web science paper on this very topic and got a top paper at a web science conference here in Koblenz, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and he, his paper was, he compared these networks, the teams that do this gold farming, with data from drug trafficking networks and found that they were identical in terms of their structural signatures. Right? So you have different kinds of teams that work in different kinds, for good as well as for bad, etc. So what did we find here? We found that people don't form teams at random. So this is not a perform, this is just a forming results. People, you know, you say you go on the web and you can play with people at random, actually you don't. You're very selective about who you play with. You play with your friends of friends for the trust reason that we talked about earlier. You are more likely to play with people of the same age as you and the same game experience as you. Distance, proximity matters. You're 22.5 times more like 22.6 times more likely to play with someone within 50 kilometers than between 50 and 800 kilometers. Time zones matter. You're 1.25 times more likely to play with someone in your own time zone than even one hour apart. And then finally, the result that surprised us was that gender did not matter. Homophily, age homophily was there, but gender homophily was not there. But this is, points out a really interesting insight. Men play with men. We found that to be true. But women are not, are not more likely to play with women. And so this is where you have limits of these kinds of web sciences because we had to deal with ethnographies to go talk to these people and say, well, what is your motivation to play the games? And what we find is that some of the women play the game because they really like it. But the majority of women who are playing these games are playing it because it's the only way they can stay connected with their male significant others who are addicted to the game. Right? 
So that's the reason you don't see the homophily effect because that's the only reason they're in the game, right? And again, it's an example of how you need to combine these methods with ethnographic and other approaches, which makes it important. So very quickly at the end, uh, looking at the assembly of other teams and the impact of other teams on you, we say teams don't assemble in a vacuum. All of us belong to multiple teams. And then some of those ways are ways in which we form new teams that are based on that. So you can look at the creation of a new team based upon previous teams. So I'm going to give a very simple example. This is software development teams on something called NanoHub. NanoHub is like Facebook for, social, for nanoscientists. Okay? So it's, it's funded by the National Science Foundation. It is based, hosted at Purdue University in Indiana. And people go in there and put various models that they're working on, simulations that people can use, but people also form software that you can run on it. So many of the people who are on NanoHub are software programmers who team up with other software programmers to write simulation tools that are then used by the public. So what is nice about this is we have data on who formed the, who were these software development teams, whether they had co-authored, cited each other, which other software development teams they belong to, but we also have data on success, on the success rate, because we know, because you have, you can't, you can't download the software. You actually have to run the simulation on the platform. So we know how many unique users are there, how many times they run it, how frequently they run it. We also have data on how often, how highly those are rated because it's like they have tagging and rating systems. And we also have how often publications cite the software that was running there. We have that from citation data. And what you see out here is a very simple and, and quick example uh, that I'm going to give you. On the x-axis, what you see is the number of other teams that a particular software team has collaborators on. So let's say the three of you are in a software team, okay? And you belong to four other teams, and you belong to three other teams, and you belong to two other teams. And these are all distinct teams. That means on the x-axis, you'll have a score of nine. That is, members of your team belong to nine unique teams. You with me on this? On the y-axis is just how many such teams existed. And what we find is that a lot of teams are connected to 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 other teams. So most of the teams, again, this is a form perform issue, most of the teams are not uh, having connections with a lot of other teams. But there are a few teams here that have connections with as many as 30 or 35 and 36 other teams. Now what you see is the coloring here. The coloring shows that blue means these were teams that had less than 250 users which means they were not so successful. The green means that the teams had more than 250 users, which means they developed software that was quite successful. It's a crude measure, and that we have, we, we've used other measures, but this is just one measure. What do you see here? That on this side on the left, you see that most of the team, the majority color there is blue, which is associated with the unsuccessful teams. That is, they developed software that had less than 250 users. What do you see on the right-hand side here? The majority color here is green. That is, teams that had connections with a lot of other teams are more likely to generate software that has more than 250 users, which you could say is a surrogate for successful software. So now what we're doing is in projects, this, these are not results, but Marcus uh, made, uh, sorry, um, Stefan made, some, uh, made, a, recommendation, made a, co a comment about that, that we have now been looking at teams in a completely different context, okay? So this is um, data that we are now uh, involved with some projects with NASA. Some of you may know that NASA is making plans to go to Mars, and not as a one-way ticket, but actually take one year to go there, one year on Mars, and one year back from Mars. And the idea is that this is a very interesting idea of a team. You've got six people. It's going to be an international crew, so it's people from different countries, Europe, U.S., etc. And they're going to go there, and so they are going to, there's no quitting the team. One year, three years, you're there. Have any of you seen the movie Martians? Okay, so they had a quit, but that was, not a, uh, that was an accidental quit. But in general, you want the people to go together and come back together, right? But that's only one team that's working with a lot of other teams back on Earth in mission control, in the scientific community, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of different people who are working uh, across teams. And so part of what we are interested in looking at is how do you understand how to put together the right team in these contexts to make sure that they work effectively. And you want to avoid things like, you know, how do they work back and forth? So this one is, you know, people sometimes have to work on their own, then they have to work with other people, and they have to come back and work on their own and different teams. So we're interested in looking at task attributes. We're interested also in making a recommender system. 
on who to put into this, right? Who are the people we should identify and what are the potential problems that come from that if you bring these six people together. And then finally, whether these people have good mental models. Because sometimes you, can have, you want people to have general agreement when they are working together. If they have very different world views, that's not going to work. But at the same time, if they have very similar world views, that also is not good because creativity comes from people having not, the, you don't want to have what is called as groupthink, where everyone thinks the same way. So part of what we're doing here is trying to understand how much of sharing is required in the mental model so that people can work together effectively without being so similar that they lose any opportunity of coming up with new creative ideas, etc. So this is me in Marseille where they are doing exercises that we're doing with NASA and the European Space Agency where they sent that person down underneath into uh, underwater and they are monitoring robots so that it's supposed to be like what they would be doing on the surface of Mars and, uh, and, and working with people within a space capsule which was back in uh, the US. So we have these experiments that we've set up between people in space capsules in the US, simulated space capsules on ground in the US, etc. And we're also going to be collecting data from International Space Station uh, in, in next year. <clears throat> so this is about understanding teams. How do we enable teams? Well, this is where we've come up with many recommender systems. And I'll just very quickly show one that I think we have set up here. Um, was it Chrome that we, I think we set up in Chrome, yeah? Yeah. So we've got a tool that we've developed called the My Dream Team tool. So this is, remember I said by, we have match.com, why don't we have the same thing for teams? So this is a demo that we have set up, this is, we've been using this tool. So this is the basic idea of the tool is, you ask people to complete a survey about different things, about their interest, you know, their preferences, who they like to hang out with, what are their skill sets, etc. And then after that what you do is after everyone has entered it, you can go in and say I want a person on my team who has this skill or who has this team quality or is similar to me in this way or is different from me in this way. And it will make recommendations for you. And then you can see which other teams those people have, are being a part of and who they has invited them. And you can send them an invitation and so on and so forth. So I'm going to very quickly, I don't have much time here, um, show you this is a demo site that we have set up with data. If you're a user, and this works, did we not do this earlier? Well, we tried it on mine. I don't know whether we tried it on yours, did we? So it basically, as a user, you will go in there and you will see all the, you can, essentially it's like choosing different criteria. Well, we can, I'll leave this later on if we can't do it right now. It says it's waiting for something. So I'm not going to take time to do it here. Maybe we'll come back to it after it is waited enough. Oops, where is my, oh, mine is the Adobe. Okay, so I'll just keep moving this along and then if that shows up, we can look at it later. Um, I don't, how, how is the viewing? This one? German, I can't, sorry, I spreche kein Deutsch, aber ich lerne Deutsch. Okay, thank you. So I had these backup slides here available if you want to look at it. So you go, you log in, you can, as an administrator, you can say, I want people to form teams of this size and what kind of range and which days you want it. And then you, this is what people see. I want, I, you know, I want to have people, I want to have people who have, it's not very clear here, but you get these results. You can see pictures of them, little descriptions of them. You can invite them, you can click on their profile, and then you'll get this. If you want to then invite them, you can send them a message. They can accept the message in your inbox. You will see who all have tried to uh, join you, and then you can decide whether you want, you can reply to them and say yes or no, etc. And so again, all of these are basically ways of showing you how you can take ideas of what teams form and then give people recommendations on how to create teams that perform better. But what is nice about something like this is that not only are we giving people a tool to try to do match.com, but we're getting data that we can use to understand which of these teams are going to be more effective than the others. And one of the interesting ways in which to think about what we do in web science is to provide tools that not only help people, but in the process of helping people, help us as researchers to understand how to make these processes more effective. In, the, in about a week from now, um, uh, I've talked, um, with Stefan and with Ulrich that we will have you play a game that we have developed in a lab called Six Dos. So Kioske, who is in the lab and is familiar with the game, will help you with it. And the game is a very simple idea. The idea is that each of you, it doesn't make sense to play it today, but imagine if after one week you've got to know each other well, some of you know, got to know each other well, 
you will be asked to pick five people who are your new friends in this group, or six people, whatever, some number. And everyone picks the five or six people that they think are their good friends. And after that is done, you will then be told, okay, you have to send a message to so-and-so person who's not one of your direct contacts, but who is three degrees of separation or four degrees of separation from you. And the challenge for you is to decide that out of the five people you chose, you can only send it to one person. Which one person should you send it to who's most likely to get it to somebody, who's most likely to get it to somebody, who's most likely to get it to the final target? And that illustrates a really important concept that we have to deal with today, and that is not just who knows who, but who knows who knows who. It's in our mind we have models of our networks, network awareness. How aware are we of the network? Do we know who connects to whom, etc.? And when you play this game, you'll see initially you'll have some strategies, and then you might evolve your strategies and see how good you are in playing this particular game. And it'll tell you a lot about it. Now, we play this game because it, students find it quite addictive. So when we play this game, there's a lot of people who are constantly, oh, let's play it again, let's play it again. But what is really interesting is that because we have data about each of the people, it helps us understand who is more likely to be network aware and who is more likely to send the message to other people. Do you send it to someone similar to you? Do you send it to someone similar to the target? Why are you sending these messages to different people? And so it is helping us improve the science of understanding how these things go. Okay, so then in closing this project, I'm not going to spend much time talking much about it, but it's basically the idea of scale up that I said. And what is really interesting for me as a network scientist is when I was told, oh, all I need to do is go and remember we are trying to take a global health solution and to make other people use it. So I, it's not just one person. We know it works in, a, in two or three cases. How do I get everyone in the country to use it or everyone in the state to use it? Well, as a network scientist, for me the problem was quite simple. It said, oh, I can just do a network analysis and say, find out who seeks advice from whom, and then if they come and tell me, that I need to make sure that, what I'm trying to read those labels, Brett? Brett. So if I want to try to convince Brett, then all I have to do is find out who the people Brett said he was influenced by, and if I can then get those people to influence Brett, then that will be automatically taken care of. And I presented a very nice dashboard to the people in India, this is the Gates Foundation. And they said, that's great, that's really helpful, because sometimes people do network analysis and just have pretty pictures. You're actually showing us who to influence whom and giving us what they call a do board rather than just a dashboard. But then they asked me immediately the next question. Well, okay, I found out that Abdul Rahman is the one who should influence Brett, but what should Abdul Rahman tell Brett? And I scratched my head. I said, well, as a network scientist, I made you a match.com that told you so-and-so should go on a date with so-and-so, but now you're telling me, well, what should he say on the date to the other person? Right? And that made me realize that there's a whole field of social influence, not in network science, but in psychology, where the focus is not on who to influence, but how to influence. And so I collaborated with one of my collaborators who's a psychologist out of Georgia Tech. In fact, she's now moving to Northwestern. And we, we wrote an article that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where for the first time we said, look at this. There are people who study social influence from a social network perspective, and there are people who study it from a social psychology perspective. And these groups have never talked together, but if we really want to scale it up, we need to combine who to influence with how to influence. Yes? Um, so what you described, um, I know in German as a term of bubble. So someone is in a bubble. Yes. Like maybe there's the same politicians, maybe live in a bubble. In a bubble. Uh -huh. But they are communicate via media with right. all people, right. but they have their reality yes. and their bubble. Yes. Yeah. Yeah so, the idea, yeah, so the idea here is very similar. It says that sometimes if I have to convince you, in general, science communication people say, oh, look at climate change, look at health issues. If only I could tell Stefan what is the correct health issue, he will definitely follow it. Well, it turns out that's not true. That's, well, it may be true for Stefan, but it's not true for everyone. So the reason that is the case is because we find that some people in this world have a desire, are going to be influenced because they have a desire to be right. They're interested in facts. But there's another group of people who live in the bubble who are not interested in facts, who are interested in being, they, ha, they will be influenced because they have a desire not to be right, but to be liked. And so sometimes you can convince certain people about something, not by giving them the facts, you're wasting your time. 
But if you give them some a way of showing that you have a liking to them or that you have a reciprocity, you give them a gift and then they are more likely to do it or you do them some favor and they're more likely to do it, etc. And that in fact the world is very well split up into these two groups. And so that's why it's really important not to always assume that if Abdul Rahman has to influence Brett, that the only thing Abdul Rahman has to tell Brett is factually what is good about this. Maybe what Abdul Rahman needs to do instead is to say, I'll give you a free sample, try this out. Or I, you know, we have these things in common, we are friends. So as a friend, I'm saying that this is a good thing for you to do, not because it's factually driven. Okay? So that's what we mean by combining the who to influence with the how to influence. And so basically what I hope, I, this is a summary, I'm going to uh, pass this in the interest of time. What I've done is I've given three grand societal challenges here that I've talked about based on the research we've done in the lab. And in each of them I've tried to show how you start with certain theories, how you use certain interesting methods, you have novel ways of collecting data, and then you're able to answer questions, not only science questions, how something happens, but how can you do something to help them. Remember we had a recommender system, we had a dashboard. In the case of this, we provided them with the dashboard of who to influence and what Abdul Rahman should say to Brett, etc. And that just leaves it for me to acknowledge our funders and the large number of really smart people that we have in our lab. This is one of the rare occasions where I actually have one person in the audience in the lab. But um, in general, I always like to say that the reason I'm able to come and talk and give presentations like this is not because of what I do, but because of all the really smart people in the lab who work and uh, who have been behind all the results that you're seeing out here. So, so I'll stop with that and thank you very much. The fallacy of composition, okay. Because, for example, when you do the uh, research in, in uh, play the, in the game, yeah. you, you bet, your baseline is the people that are playing yes. are interested in the, in the game. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's about that sharing values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first step is that you're looking for uh, to someone or to some people that are interested in the same values. Right. So you're not, you're not, in other words, uh, the null model is people, uh, are you choosing people, but you only have people who are already interested in the game. You're not looking at people who are not interested in the game and, and to see whether they form teams. That's a very good point. In fact, when we published the article about scientific uh, funded research proposals, when we funded that in uh, the Journal of uh, Infometrics, one of the things that the reviewer said and which we acknowledge is that when you see who submits proposals and who teams with whom, we are only looking at this, the whole sample, the data set, is only people who submitted proposals. We are not looking at the entire class of potential people who could have submitted proposals because that is too large. Right? So that is a limitation that we have to work with and that, that, there is there's nothing that we can do. There is no, there's no easy way to do that. There are ways in which we have thought about it. Can you match those people with people who didn't submit proposals and look at the qualities so that if you look at the characteristics of the people who did submit it and then match them with people who did not submit it but who have exactly the same qualities. So we have a, pr a project right now that I'm doing with a colleague at uh, Harvard Medical School that is funded through the NIH that's looking also at dynamics of network assembly and, and, and then we have two projects, one with Harvard Medical School, the other with Brian Utsi, uh, my colleague and that's called DNA which stands for dynamics of network assembly. And there we are trying to match people who are actually submitted proposals and form teams with people who are similar to them but did not form teams. And I think that gets at what you are talking about. I, yes. yes. It is not easy, but, but we are working on, 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 on looking at that approach to it. Maybe uh, if you can make your commitment. Yeah. Uh, for example, in, in, the, uh, in the Watson. Yes. Watson, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some people are more interested in uh, the research. Mm -hmm. Yes. So maybe the people that are interested in the wage, they are not have motivated to do that. So that is interesting. When I talked to David Furushi, I should mention that David is no longer at IBM. He now runs a, he runs a center lab 
within Bridgewater Associates, which is one of the larger hedge funds in the US. But uh, one of the things that David said was actually the people who were really motivated by research. So your point is, well, if you're motivated by research, you'll be more interested in doing Watson. If you're more motivated by wages, you don't want to take the risk. What he found was an interesting further distinction, that some of the people who were interested in research didn't want to do this. Because they would not, that means five years without publishing papers, because during this period of time, they were actually in the business of building something. It was not necessarily doing research. And so he had conversations with people where he would tell them, look, what are you planning to do in the next five years? And someone would say, oh, I need to do research. I want to publish 12 articles. And then he tried to convince them, like, okay, do you think your 12 articles are at the end of the day going to be able to have the same impact like a Watson would? And they go, well, but it's, if, if Watson succeeds, yes, the 12 articles will not be so important. But if Watson fails, then I've lost the opportunity to write 12 articles. So it's, you know, even those who were motivated by research were sometimes not convinced that they should work on Watson because it meant that they wouldn't be writing the research articles, which at least would give them some level of safety in terms of publication. Yes, so I agree. The triggers, they may often, if the motivations can vary across people. Yep. Sit rep situation oh, reports. Sorry. Yep. And uh, you mentioned, okay. you mentioned also the um, yeah they they did the a map of it the metric mm -hmm. the so network. Uh -huh. Was it done by humans or by a machine? That was done by a machine. So we did it okay. by machine. So we used a. A, a, a software, so this was pretty earlier on, right? This yeah. is 10 years ago. But at NCSA, they had developed a tool called T2K. They started out with a tool called D2K, data to knowledge. And then they created a tool called T2K, text to knowledge. Yeah. And so that, this was done by text extraction. Yeah. But it was 10 years later. No, 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 it was done the, 10 years ago. When the uh, catastrophe happened. Yes, it happened right that year. And then there was the technology already. Yeah, that yeah. It was popular. Yes, yeah, which is why it's, it's so interesting to talk about it now because, you know, at the time people were not talking about text analytics. But fortunately, I happened to be at NCSA where even though they didn't use the word text analytics, they had developed the software called T. In fact, today T2K doesn't exist. I googled it. It doesn't exist. But 10 years ago, they had developed it as a prototype, as a proof of concept. But it was an early example of this. Yes. Ah, how did, how did he access the data? Oh, it was log files. I can say a couple of things about it. I'll say a couple of things about it because it speaks to the general issue of how do we get access to data. Uh, so this was data provided by Sony and they didn't just come to me and say, you know, let me give you some data. That's not how it works as many of us have discovered, right? But there are always creative ways in which we want to keep our eye out for getting these kinds of data. In this particular case, my colleague Dimitri Williams, who's at USC, he was at the time my colleague at Illinois, he was working with them on gaming environments. He's a specialist in online gaming. They told, came to him and said, you know, we have one problem. We have, we, people pay money to play this game, but we sometimes lose people from the game. And we would love to find a way in which we can, just like in telephone companies, they have data on churn, how people quit the telephone company, the same way they're afraid. And so they said, do you know anyone? We think that people's networks have an impact on whether they stay in the game or not. So part of the reason that we, they, so Dimitri told them, oh, I have a colleague who studies networks. And he might be interested in looking at dynamic networks to predict who is likely to leave the game and who that person should network with in order to make sure they don't leave the game. So the way we start that is it's a win-win situation. We offer them something that would help them and in exchange for that they would give us the data. So, that, so always be opportunistic in looking for ways in which when you're working with certain commercial partners, we are working, Kioski in particular is working now also with a company called Threadless. Any of you heard of Threadless? So Threadless is a website where people can submit designs for t-shirts and other people will comment on the t-shirt design and then some people will uh, vote on it and then the company decides whether they will print the t-shirt. And then you can buy the t-shirt. So notice this company is not designing t-shirts. They're not hiring people to do it. It's crowdsourcing the design, crowdsourcing the review of the design, crowdsourcing the voting of the design, and then all you do is print it and make money and of course give some of that back to the people who designed the t-shirt. 
Okay? So in that case, again, it was an accidental case. In that case, it was not a need. An undergraduate student of mine who took my networks class went to do an internship, summer internship at Threadless, which is based in Chicago. And he told them, oh, have you thought about using networks to understand which, which, you know, how people generate opinions about this? And they go, we never heard of it. And so the student met my TA for the class at a ca in the cafeteria and said, oh, I work at this place. You know, they are interested in this. They are willing to give you the data. Are you interested? And my TA said, yeah, we are interested. So we built up now a whole big project on that. Now we have an NSF grant on it. So always look for opportunistic ways. But one last comment about what you asked also. The data that we get in these ways is not the data that we would have necessarily collected. Because server logs is not data that was designed to do research. The server logs is often data that is collected by programmers to make sure they can debug software. Seriously. And so very often, in this case of the in online games, this particular data set, there was no simple way in which you could know which people formed a team together. They didn't think about it. They said, why should we want to do that? It doesn't help us with our debugging. Yes, but it helps us with our research. But we spent a lot of time trying to be creative and find out who were the people who were on a team together because that data was not directly available from any table in any of the server logs that we had. And we had over two terabytes of data. So again, you know, th that, that's the sort of nitty gritty of how this happens. And I'm sure you'll learn more about those issues in the next couple of weeks out here. So. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thanks so much. Thank you.